It is always a pleasure and privilege to be a part of the ministry of Ligonier that has had such a profound impact uh, on all of us, myself included, and uh, also to uh, be able to share the platform here with uh, two of my heroes and friends. Uh, I'm glad to hear if, I heard, if I heard him right, that Alistair Begg is writing a book on the Beatles. <laughs> and he's the one to write it since he's part of the witness protection program, so you can't really uh, tell in any other way than by his looks. He is actually the only Beatle who was knighted, so uh, it's a real privilege. Turn with me, if you will, from the story you have just heard to the sequel in Acts chapter 1. Acts uh, uh, being the second volume of a two-volume work, uh, Luke wrote his gospel for Theophilus, who was a noble person. In fact, uh, the same uh, words, noble and uh, excellent, are used by the Apostle Paul when he refers uh, to the uh, addresses, the Roman governors. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a title of deference to some kind of a leader who was open to hearing the gospel. And Luke was collecting the reminiscences of uh, the church, uh, the closest community to the events that we're talking about here. And Luke is volume one and Acts is volume two. So he says, beginning uh, uh, verse one, chapter one of Acts, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking... He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. What a marvelous report that bolsters our faith and shows us that the ascension is not simply an exclamation point to the resurrection, but is itself a part of the gospel. The ascension itself is as much a part of the gospel as the resurrection. Uh, churches in uh, the uh, Reformed tradition have often celebrated Ascension Day with particular gusto. And at first it seems odd. Why would you celebrate the day Jesus left? Why would that be a particularly great moment? Surely the disciples felt that way. Uh, okay, first of all, we were uh, on that road to Emmaus that we've heard about, and uh, we were completely disillusioned. And then you opened up the scriptures and sh showed us what the plot really meant. And we recognized you in the, in the uh, breaking of the bread, and we acknowledged you as the resurrected Christ. And so now as you bring your community together around your resurrection and your kingship, you leave. And so the disciples really were a, a, a bit uh, turned around in their thinking. Still, even after the resurrection, they were wondering about what it all meant. He was lifted up, but on a cross, cursed. And now that he has been raised, why would he leave? Part of the story uh, that unfolds for us in this chapter 
requires a little bit of spade work in terms of the backdrop that was assumed by the original audience. The whole Old Testament finds its major redemptive historical connections in terms of the exodus, the wilderness, and the conquest. That is the plot line that formed every catechism class of, of every Jewish kid. So the, the central Old Testament event, of course, was the exodus, when God brought his people out of Egyptian slavery with a strong hand. In Exodus 15, 3, we read, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord, Yahweh, is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. Central event in Israel's history. God remembered his covenant to Abraham. Moses prefigures Christ. In many ways, he barely escapes massacre, just as Jesus would. He was endowed with the Spirit, just as Jesus was. He gave the law on a mount, just as Jesus gave his law on a mount. And yet, as Hebrews points out, Moses was a servant, and Jesus was a son. Unlike Moses, Jesus won't cross the sea unharmed on dry land, but will be swallowed up by death before death has to give him back up. Paul even identifies the cross as Jesus' Red Sea crossing in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. But also, unlike Moses, Jesus will lead his people triumphantly into the promised land. Moses was barred because of the people's stubbornness, that wilderness generation. He was barred and had to look from afar down upon the land that would be conquered by his lieutenant, Joshua. It's interesting, not to make too much of it, but uh, it's the same name as Jesus, Shua. In Jesus, you have both Moses, who leads the people through the Red Sea, because he himself is swallowed up for them, but then comes out through the other side and is qualified to lead them into the promised land. Jesus was tested in the wilderness. His 40 days recapitulated Israel's 40 years wandering around in circles. Israel demanded, like Adam and Eve, the food they craved. But when the same Satan came to Jesus and said, turn these stones into bread, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. All of Jesus' replies to Satan, in fact, in his temptation in Matthew 4, are taken from Moses' speech in Deuteronomy 6. There's the Exodus. There's also the conquest. The goal of the Exodus was not just liberation, but liberation for God. Not just liberation from Pharaoh, but liberation for Yahweh. I will be your God and you will be my people. I am the one who delivered you from the hand of Pharaoh. Therefore, you will have no other gods besides me. The goal of the Exodus was so that God could dwell safely in the midst of his people. And that's a theme running throughout the scriptures. God in the midst of his people. And the dominant picture here is of a banquet. It's used over and over and over again. The sign of peace, of salvation, of shalom. Everlasting safety and happiness and righteousness and joy is eating and drinking in the presence of the Lord. It's a feast. Eating and drinking in the presence of the Lord is a prominent theme uh, in the historical books, and it recurs in the feastings, the various feasts that you have in Luke's gospel. Eating and drinking in the presence of God in a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty. In the wilderness, God had to pitch his tent outside the camp. It's too dangerous for God to live in the midst of his people because his people were evil. And so he said, I need, I need a, a, a priest and sacrifices 
and a temple worship between the people and me. And so God graciously condescends to forgive their sins through the mediation of the priesthood that he sets up in the wilderness and then is taken to the permanent temple as it is established under Solomon in Jerusalem. And the tabernacle, as it gave way to the temple, the permanent structure, had a tripartite structure. It's divided into three parts, the outer court of the Gentiles, the inner court of the Jews, and then the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could enter one time, one time a year. Israel was to cleanse the land. In this conquest, Israel was to finally be the means of God executing his wrath. Remember, he told Abram, all of this will happen 500 years after you have gone down into Egypt. Your descendants will go down to Egypt. They will be slaves. And after that, I will bring them out with a strong hand. But I'm not ready for you to conquer the land I am going to give you because the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. And so when the time had fully come for God to unleash his wrath, Joshua led the people into the promised land. It wasn't ethnic cleansing. It wasn't a geopolitical move that people used uh, uh, to, uh, uh, where they used God to sort of justify their, their political ambitions. They didn't even do it well. They backed off repeatedly, refusing to fully execute the judgment that was a sign of the last judgment. What we can all be grateful for is that it, it, God limited the judgment at that time to the Amorites, the Hittites, the, the, the other ites Israel was going to, in to conquer. He didn't just wipe out the whole human race. And yet, like Adam, God says to Hosea, like Adam, they broke my covenant. They fa failed to live before me in the land. They turned my garden which I gave them into a foul place full of idols. Instead of witnessing to the nations, they became like the nations. Instead of wanting me as their king, they wanted a king like the nations. And so I threw them out. In Leviticus, God warned Israel, this is not your land, this is my land. You are but tenants, he told them, in my land. And he evicted them. Israel went into exile. This is where Israel was when Jesus began preaching. There was a sense, especially among the Pharisees, that we are living still in the time of the exile. Yes, we're still, we're, we're living in Israel it, but it is, it's not the old covenant. We're living under the oppression of the Romans. We're not living under the conditions of Torah. And so the Pharisees were very concerned to restore Israel's obedience to Torah so that Messiah could come and resurrect the old covenant theocracy. The Pharisees were the ones who actually believed that all this would happen and it would culminate in the resurrection of the dead. That's why one of Paul's points in his arguments in court before King Agrippa was, I, I think I'm being put on trial for being a Pharisee, for believing in the resurrection. Now what we find in Acts, first of all, is a new exodus. Luke begins by telling Theophilus that uh, Jesus was crucified. He says, after his sufferings, these things happened. There's no exodus without Passover. But he was the Passover lamb. Instituting the supper on the eve of his crucifixion with the ambient noise of bleeding Passover sheep. Passover sheep. 
Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. Drink all of it. And thereby instituted his last will and testament, which he executed on the cross. He was raised by many proofs, he says in verse 3. As Jesus uh, told his, his judges, none of this was done in a corner. You're all very aware of the events that I'm referring to. Jesus the Nazarene, Peter proclaimed in Acts 2.22. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested from God to you by acts of power and wonders and signs which God did through him among you. This is, as we've heard, different from any apologetic for any religion where you, you, you testify to actual things that happened in history. You know, most, most religions like timeless ideas and timeless morality. Well, I like, I like these principles because they, they help me cope in the world. Uh, I think those principles are right, and Christianity has a lot of principles that it shares with Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism and, and uh, Oprah, and we... we we can, we can pool all of those intersecting areas. That's where the real truth is. Not where we have all the, the disagreements about what happened to bodies and uh, uh, what happened in history. Those historical claims which are so exclusive and separate us and divide us. The, the apostles didn't write the lines of that hymn that hopefully none of, none of you sings on uh, Easter. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Not on the worst day did any of the apostles offer that to their critics. No, they, they knew that God had attested this Jesus of Nazareth by many miracles, by signs and wonders, and they did not testify to themselves, they testified to him. When asked how they know he lives, the apostles offered reasons, arguments, evidences from their own eyewitness accounts, which were accumulated over 40 days between Easter and Ascension Day. And Thomas wouldn't even believe until Jesus condescended to allow him to inspect his resurrected body. Talk about empirical. And only then did Thomas say, my Lord and my God. It's a new exodus. There's also a new wilderness experience. Not for 40 years, but for 40 days between Easter and the Ascension. It was 40 days of preparation. This was a Berlitz seminary course. For, for this period of time, for a little over a month... Jesus, day and night, was immersing his apostles in what they needed to know in order to be his witnesses. Now, they could have said, well, we're just, we're, we're just going to run out. We're going to go send ourselves. But we know, we know, we know. We know what to say. We know we're going to be your ambassadors. We're going to represent you out there. And Jesus says, you need to sit down and you need to learn. Well, no, we need to, we need to build your kingdom. We've got work to do out there. No, what you need to do is sit down and I'm going to teach you for 40 days. Intensive instruction and we read he was mainly teaching them about the kingdom. He was teaching them about the kingdom. And now, just as the first Yeshua led the Israelites into Canaan at the end of 40 years, the second Yeshua, the true Yeshua, ends his 40 days by entering into the heavenly Canaan. That theme of eating and drinking with God that we find throughout, especially uh, Deuteronomy and Joshua, uh, is present here in Luke's gospel, and it's intentional. Uh, and while eating with them, and while eating with them, he told them these things. There are two purposes for mentioning uh, that it was while he was eating 
with them. First of all, stressing the reality of his resurrection. I have no doubt that was, that was part of it. While he was eating with them, remember in Luke 24, at the end of his gospel, just before the uh, passage on the ascension, as Jesus is described in these 40 days with his disciples, he says, uh, anybody have any fish? Starving. You know, why, do, why is this included? Of all things, you know, you've got to edit this down into a gospel. Why do you mention Jesus asking for fish? He himself says, because do ghosts eat like this? <laughs> Don't you see that I have flesh and bones? Don't you see that I'm alive? That I'm, I'm really here. It is I. I'm not just with you in spirit. I, I'm with you in the, the whole person of my existence. And so he's eating and drinking with them. But there's another reason for this, and I think it's closer to the heart of what he's doing here. It's a renewal of his new covenant promise that he made in the upper room with his disciples. Calvin points out that in the meal in Luke 24, the words and actions are identical to those that Jesus employed in the upper room. Take, break, and eat. Take, break, and eat. Only in this case, Jesus is the meal. Jesus makes himself the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. He is the substance of our salvation. And that's why it becomes a central part of New Covenant worship, the breaking of the bread in Acts 2. They gathered regularly for the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Or as we heard from the Emmaus Road, discussion in Luke 24. They heard Jesus open up the scriptures and their hearts burned within them as he explained how he was the center of all of the Old Testament revelation, but they still were kept from recognizing him until they went home and after the common meal, this guest upset all of the rules of hospitality in the ancient Near East and started taking over the meal. And the same phrase is used there. He blessed, took, broke, and gave. This bread that we break, says Paul, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? This cup that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? So eating and drinking in the presence of the Lord is a very big part of this wilderness experience and it's one of those parts that keeps on going in our experience today. The difference is that Jesus ate and drank with them. And now, in the power of the Spirit, we eat and drink together with Jesus as the substance. And one day, he says, he will eat and drink with us bodily. Jesus gives a charge to those whom he has liberated and has brought into the wilderness and is about to lead across the Jordan into the field of conquest. Just as Moses gave a charge to the Israelites before he died and Joshua led the people into Canaan. Here we read, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now it's not only Jerusalem, but it's to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth that become the field of conquest here. The whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But first they have to learn. Before they can go, they have to learn. Apostles are ambassadors. They do not send themselves. They are sent. And before they go, they need to be prepared by Jesus' instruction and the Spirit's empowerment. Jesus speaks of the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was already a Jewish festival of harvest in gathering. And just as Pentecost came 50 days 
uh, after Passover in the Jewish calendar, the new Pentecost, the real Pentecost, came 50 days after the true Passover. Who is this promise of the Father? Just remember, stay there and wait for the promise of the Father which you have heard from me. When? When did they hear from him about this promise from the Father? Well, in the upper room. When Jesus was already preparing them in John 15 and 16 uh, for his departure. He said, it is good that I go away. Can you imagine how they would have thought at that point? Peter already wasn't uh, very happy with him talking about the cross all the time. Three times Jesus brought up he was going to Jerusalem to die, and they were thinking, no, we're going to Jerusalem uh, for the parade, for the inauguration. The mother of uh, James and John, Mary, one of those who was present at the tomb, uh, she said, Jesus, uh, can I, uh, just a couple words with you over here? Just take five minutes. I know you're busy, but five minutes. And uh, yeah, what is it? And she says, we're getting close to Jerusalem now. I know others, there, there's talk. I just want to, before everything sort of gets real busy, can I just ask you, my two sons, can one sit on the left and one on the right when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says, woman, you don't have any idea what you're asking. Because, of course, that meant crucified on both sides of Jesus. They didn't get that. And, and Jesus brings it up three times. And finally, the last time, Jesus tells Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for your thoughts are not the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of men. Stop trying to dissuade me from the cross. For this purpose, he says, I have come into the world. He said in the upper room, it is better that I go. When I go to the Father, I will send you the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is, I need to go for two reasons. Number one, you need me more up there than you do down here now. I've done down here what I need to do. You need me up there. And I'm going to go cleanse the land. I'm going to pull the old ancient serpent out of the heavenly throne room where he accuses the brethren day and night. I'm going to cast him out forever. You need me to do that? You need me to intercede for you that your faith will not fail? You need to, me to intercede for you when you are unfaithful? You need me up there now. I'm the only mediator between God and man. And you need the Holy Spirit down here more than you need me down here. You need the Holy Spirit because you don't get any of this, I've noticed. I've been here for 40 days teaching you stuff, and it's still kind of hard for you to wrap your... You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to guide you into all of the truth that I have delivered to you, and you need the Holy Spirit to empower you to be witnesses, because as we've heard, you know, you weren't exactly courageous the last couple of weeks. I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But you must stay in the city until you are clothed from on high with power. Remember when Moses said, Oh, if only all of the Lord's people were filled with the Spirit. Joel prophesied that in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Men, women, young, old. And that is exactly what he is preparing his people for. They cannot enter into the conquest on earth until he has entered into the conquest in heaven. And the Holy Spirit has been sent from that heavenly conquest to lead them to conquer the nations. And so now it's a new conquest, and they ask the question, okay, I'm getting the story now. No, I'm getting it. I really am. I, I, I get Exodus. We've been through the Exodus, and now the wilderness, and the conquest is next. I'm there. Okay, this, there was a delay. We expected it all at once, but now you're saying the kingdom has come. Now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel. 
Now, in one sense, it's not a bad question because he was speaking to them of the kingdom, but you can tell by the way they ask it that they're still thinking in terms of a restoration of the old covenant theocracy, driving the Girgashites and the Canaanites and the Hittites out of the land again, driving out the Romans this time. Anybody else? Cleansing the land once and for all this time with Jesus at the helm? But it's not that bad of a question because Jesus was speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. What it reminds us of is is this. We don't really understand the ascension. We don't even really understand the resurrection if we think of it as Greeks rather than Jews. One thing that Jews were united on was they were not expecting a messianic age to take place in an ethereal kind of, uh, just in individual hearts. It included that, but it was the whole creation. The whole creation is groaning under the bondage of sin, and the whole creation will be liberated. And that's why they thought that it was all going to happen at once. The Messiah would come. He wouldn't be crucified. Messiah would come. All of our our suffering as a nation is in the past. We don't need a Messiah to suffer for us. We have rededicated ourselves to Torah, and then he will drive out the Romans reinstitute the theocracy, and once he has reinstituted the theocracy, there will be the resurrection of the just. They did not redu- their field of vision was not reduced to me and what goes on inside of me. They certainly didn't think of it as going to heaven when you die. The ultimate hope Certainly, it is a a Christian hope that we go to heaven when we die. But the ultimate hope is not that we go to heaven when we die. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now will you restore the kingdom to Israel. Where are we on the clock, Jesus? Now is all of that going to kick in. Now will... You're raised, but... Why isn't everybody else raised? What are the Romans still doing here? You're confusing us. And now you're leaving. Is Israel's exile over? It isn't a replay of the conquest. And so basically, Jesus' answer is, yes, but not in the way that you imagined. Stay tuned. Stay in Jerusalem. Spirit will arrive and he will empower you to become my witnesses, he says. My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the fact that he precedes this with a statement, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, suggests that the full realization of this kingdom consummation he's talking about is off in the distance, but for now... Go to Jerusalem and wait, and you will be my witnesses. And then the end will come. So what he's saying is, his ascension is opening up a fissure in history. It's opening up a space, and you better be glad that there is this space because we're sitting here in it. We better be glad that the second temple expectations of Pharisees was not fulfilled. We better be glad that it wasn't all done at once because we would have been condemned in the last judgment that took place 2,000 years ago. We are creatures of that in-between time. We are creatures of that. We are born in the crevice between this age and the age to come, which is called the era of the last days. Ever since... The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. The clock has been running down on this present evil age. It is at that very moment that the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. History was redefined as these last days of this present regime. It is good that Jesus went. And it is good that the Holy Spirit came. 
Calvin says now the means of all of this is his gospel. Also, that is why Jesus Christ spoke so often of the gospel, calling the gospel the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom can also be translated the gospel, which is the kingdom. It is not then without cause that the gospel is called the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ always has some company wherever the gospel is preached, for he is not a king without his subjects. But it's not the way the disciples thought. It's not a geopolitical kingdom. It doesn't move with flashing swords, but with the sword of his word. Not by political power and coercion, not by ballots, but by his spirit. And in verse 9, Jesus exhibits his threefold office among his disciples. As prophet, he reveals the Father's unfolding plan. As priest, he ascends to the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for us. He continues his mediatorial work this very hour in heaven for us. And as king, he has bound Satan so that he can no longer deceive the nations. First, Jesus said during his ministry, the strong man has to be bound, has to be tied up. Only then can you loot his house. What's Jesus doing right now up there while we're waiting? Where did he go? He's looting Satan's house by his spirit through our witness to the ends of the earth. As they were looking on, he was taken up. Notice that. The emphasis, all of the empirical clauses here in the narrative, as they were looking on, not with every head bowed and every eye closed. This is not an event that happened in the experience of the disciples. While they were looking at the same one they had bumped into hour after hour of every day for the last three years, whose breath they smelled, whose hand they shook, while they were looking upon that same embodied friend and master, he was taken up. Nothing less than a cloud gathered around him and took him up. Once again, harkening back, to, harkening back to the scenes from the Old Testament, the cloud that led Israel through the Red Sea. That cloud which filled the tabernacle and then filled the temple. That cloud is nothing less than the Holy Spirit Himself. The Holy Spirit is the glory cloud of God. The same cloud who evacuated the temple and sent Israel into exile and now will descend again and regather his exiled people around the Messiah and make him his witnesses. What are you looking at? <laughs> Why stand gazing? These two witnesses ask. Why stand gazing? We just heard about the two witnesses, the two heavenly witnesses, the two heavenly messengers, the angels, uh, in the, the resurrection account at the, in Luke 24. They're sent from heaven to witnesses on earth. And it's two, where, you know, on the witness of two or three witnesses, on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's the, that's the criterion for making a judgment. And these two witnesses, these two angels come from heaven. And it may be the two, same two witnesses who were at the tomb. It's described in similar terms, two men in white robes. And they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus is very, very similar to the, the sort of odd question. Why do you stand here looking into heaven? It's just as odd as asking, as asking them, uh, uh, you, why did you come here to seek the dead? Uh, should be, you know, didn't you come to, to, to find the living? The expectation here is not exactly what they had in mind. Why are you looking up into heaven? Why wouldn't they be looking up into heaven? They just saw Jesus ascend. <laughs> But the point that these witnesses clearly have is uh, 
Next, the next new thing that God is doing here. Keep your eye on the ball. Things are moving. The ball is in play. Stop just staring up into the sky. He's gone. He's really gone for a long time. And you can't get him to come down out of heaven by ringing your bells. You can't pull him down from heaven by your enthusiasm or by your rituals or by your prayers even. But he will send his spirit. And his spirit will be the giver of Christ and his saving presence to us in this present evil age. The same spirit by whom Jesus was conceived, will be poured out on us. The same Spirit who clothed Jesus in our humanity will clothe us in His glorious likeness. A cloud came and took Him out of their sight. Luke 24 tells us similarly in the closing verses of Luke, then He led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now, that would be a short honeymoon. They would soon be thrown out of the temple and thrown out of the synagogues, flogged and beaten, and the temple itself would be destroyed by the Romans with not one stone left upon another just as Jesus had predicted. But something greater had happened. By being thrown out of the temple that was no longer a temple, through their witness, Jesus by His Spirit from heaven was building a temple made without hands. By being thrown out of the temple and the synagogues, they were scattered to the ends of the earth. And by their testimony, living stones were added to the sanctuary of the end times. So now there's a gap. There's a gap between Jesus' earthly ministry in the past and his return in the future. What's the delay for? Well, Peter reminds us that it's because of God's kindness leading us to repentance. And yet it's an occasion for the wicked to mock, saying, where is this promise of His coming? For things go on as they always have. This kingdom is a kingdom of forgiveness and grace. Isn't it amazing? The kingdom that was just a shadow, just a type, was powerful and geopolitical with a big, beautiful temple, gold glistening off of the edges of it. You could see it from miles away. But that's the shadow. That's the... That's the ephemeral passing away. And the reality is a kingdom that couldn't capture a CNN headline. No one is going to send a truck out to record Christians at prayer. No one's going to send a truck out for a communion service or for a sermon. And yet, it is the conquest greater than any conquest recorded in the historical books of the Old Testament. And it's a conquest of forgiveness that brings healing and hope and love. Instead of driving the nations out, it's bringing the nations in through faith in Jesus Christ. What fills this gap? What makes up for Christ's absence? Nothing. Absolutely nothing fills up this gap. He's got to come back. He has to come back before this wound is healed. But in the meantime, we stumble, we stagger, held up by the Holy Spirit who is indwelling us as the down payment on our final redemption, knowing that one day we will enter in our bodies just as Jesus did as our forerunner and captain. There is no substitute for Jesus in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit doesn't even try to be a substitute. Instead, the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ. 
The Holy Spirit doesn't say, well, I'll be here until he gets back. The Holy Spirit says, I will come and I will indwell you so that you, I will unite you to Christ more than Peter was united to Christ before his resurrection. So that our union with Christ is just as real as Peter's was at Pentecost. As a result, he sends us out. He is the missionary God. He sends the Son on a mission. The Son returns, and the Father and the Son send the Spirit on a mission. And then through the Spirit, the Father and the Son send us out on a mission to the world. And that's why you have Matthias chosen. That's an odd thing, right? Right in the middle of all of this, doesn't it seem anticlimactic that you, you go to, from the ascension to Pentecost and right in the middle, you've got some church government uh, uh, bureaucratic meeting going on about who's going to replace Judas and Matthias is the one who's chosen. Why, would, why do we need to all know all that? Because it's not an invisible kingdom. It is not yet visible in the way that it will be, but it is visible through preaching, sacrament, and church discipline. And so church discipline, the setting up of order, was important for Jesus as he left so that he can reign as the king over his church through those whom he sends as administrators, as office bearers on earth for his reign. But no vicar, there is no vicar for Christ. No substitute, that's what vicar means. No stand-in, whether he's in Rome or in Houston or in Wheaton or wherever. There is no vicar. There is no substitute. We are not a substitute either. Our work is not an extension of the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. We witness to the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. We are not an extension of the incarnation. We are not the gospel. We are witnesses to Christ and His gospel. And so these decisions were made concerning replacing Judas because the apostles were the living witnesses who testified to the resurrection and were authorized to do so by the risen Christ. The apostles, we read, whom He had chosen. So the church doesn't even replace the body of Christ. Surely if the Spirit doesn't replace our absent Savior, neither does the church. Instead, what the, what, the, what the Holy Spirit does is actually create a longing in our hearts for Jesus' return. And the first evidence of the Spirit's descent at Pentecost is that Peter proclaims Christ from all the Scriptures. And people are cut to the quick, and they repent, and they believe, and a church is planted right there in the heart of Jerusalem. Throughout the book of Acts, church growth is described in terms of the phrase, and the word of God spread. Brothers and sisters, because Jesus is in heaven and the Holy Spirit is among us on earth, sent from the heavenly chamber, we have two paracletes, we have two attorneys, one in heaven and one on earth. And we need both of them so that we can be His witnesses to the ends of the earth and so that we can be upheld ourselves in the forgiving grace and mercies of God. At this very moment, the powers of the age to come are already breaking into this present evil age. The la- that, that, that everlasting festival that we talk about is already, we already have morsels of it, rays from that Daybreak are already inserting themselves into the dark, drab, dreary world that is called this passing evil age. And so the temple has undergone a makeover. Paul says, all the walls have been torn down out of this one. You know that outer court of the Gentiles and then the inner court of the Jews and then the really inner court of the priests? All of that's gone. Do you remember how Jesus was forgiving sins? Sure. Well, why were the 
religious leaders so mad? Well, because he was forgiving them on the temple mount without going through the temple. I am the temple. (laughs) Tear this down and I will rebuild it in three days. And we are living stones in him. No longer insiders or outsiders. He is the one in whom, in his flesh, Paul says in Ephesians, the two peoples, Jew and Gentile, have become one. And that's why a central subplot running Throughout Acts is Paul's effort to make it from Jerusalem, the city of our God, to Rome, the seat of Gentile power, the real court of the Gentiles, indeed, to the uttermost parts of the earth, so that that which is unclean can, in Christ and by His Spirit, become clean. Let me close with those familiar words from... 1 Peter 2, and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own people, so that you may declare the wonderful deeds of Him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have led us through that greater exodus, through the waters of judgment and wrath, of death and hell, and even Indeed, your wrath, so that death ultimately cannot keep its grip on us because it couldn't keep its grip on our living head. We have been taken out of bondage and led into the glorious freedom of the children of God, and yet we find ourselves still in the wilderness. And yet, on this side of Pentecost, in that great enterprise, which is your enterprise, not ours, a conquest that goes to the ends of the earth, a conquest not of pride and arrogance like all the uh, empires that we see every day in the headlines, but an empire of peace and forgiveness and love. Help us, Father, to suffer with you now by your Spirit whom you have given us so that we may reign with you there and enter in your train as a great army of those who can only thank their captain for the spoils they have inherited. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.